The Torah reading this week, Parshat Va'era, covers the first seven of the ten plagues. The narration begins at a moment of despair, picking up from where we were last week, in that Moshe feels very daunted by the fact that from arriving in Egypt, conditions have only worsened for the Jewish people. And this Parsha begins cryptically with a sentence we'll come back to toward the end. But that Hashem says, look, let's get rolling here. Now you will see all that I have, I have promised to the patriarchs and to the Jewish people come true. And then in succession, we see the seven of the first 10 plagues, which is what we're going to study this evening. Question, and this, by the way, this class is based on a framework from taken from the Malbim, who, uh, who, who was a, a 19th century Torah scholar and commentator who wrote similar to Rabbi Hirsch, he wrote it, but he wrote in Hebrew, and similar to other people trying to tie the oral tradition into the language of the Torah. A very deep thinking person with many insights into the Torah. And this is based on a talk given by Rabbi Daniel Gladstein entitled 10 Plagues Like You Never Saw Before. Let's ask a question. Why are the plagues themselves important? And I think we would agree as children at the Seder, it was perhaps the most intriguing part of the Seder. It captured the imagination. And in recent times, we have play kits and we, we show things visually to kids. But even in the Seder itself, by tradition, people have the custom to spill drops of wine out of their cup when they do each of the 10 plagues in sympathy to the Egyptians and feeling as though we're not celebrating their suffering. But we could ask a question, why are the plagues themselves important? Do we still benefit or do we still gain from analyzing and understanding the fact that the Nile River turned to blood, that frogs enveloped the land, that people were stricken by lice. What are the takeaways? And there have to be takeaways. And in fact, Rabbi Gladstein quotes from the book, Duties of the Heart, where the author there, when he talks about examining the world and finding God in the world, which is the theme of the second section of the book, Duties of the Heart, called Shar HaBechina, Examination of the World, says that there were two great gifts given to us, the Jewish people, which enable us to come to an understanding of the world in which we live. Number one is the Torah itself, the study of Torah, the mitzvot, the whole process of this being the legacy of the Jewish people and it being passed on from generation to generation to generation. And he says, equal to that, which is an astounding statement that he makes, Chavos Chavos asserts that the manner in which God miraculously intervened in the history of the world is a second co-equal opportunity for us to come to an understanding of God and the world in which we live and the meaning of life. So if we include the, the ten plagues, the Aseret HaDibra, the Aseret HaMakot, included in that concept. So we see that talking about the plagues themselves, understanding them, it's not, God forbid, an opportunity for us to gain joy and gladness on the suffering of our enemies, because we know the Torah prohibits us from doing that. But rather, it has to offer us great insights. And we're going to look at one particular approach this evening to understanding the framework of the 10 plagues. And that's the purpose of this class, and to show how this is relevant and applicable and is lessons for us to apply to ourselves today. So I'm gonna share the screen for a moment. I wanna make sure everyone can see what we're sharing. And hopefully you can see that. If you can't, please unmute yourself and tell me. But what we see here is we know that in the in the Haggadah itself, we list off the 10 plagues, which are in the boxes below, blood, frogs, lice, beasts, a plague on animals, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and missing from our chart, 
is the plague of the death of the firstborn. We also know, as we see, that the um, we we know famously that that the Haggadah teaches us that Rabbi Yehuda adds for us symbols, and those symbols are simply the first letters of each plague, the Tzach Adash Biachav, which are the Hebrew first words of um, the the Hebrew first words of um, each of the plagues, Dam Tzvardei Akinim is Ditzach Dalad Tzarichet, Adash Ayin Dalad Shin is Arov Dever Shchin, and Be'achav is Borod Ar Bechoshech Bechoros, the plague of the firstborn. So the obvious question and the wonderment is, what exactly is Rabbi Yehuda teaching us? I mean, it doesn't seem very erudite to take the first letters and group them. So obviously there's the grouping itself that he does. And in fact, there are many, many, many different ways of understanding it. And, and what we're not going to do tonight, left over from a previous class here, is that Hirsch, Shabshmuel first grouped them, tells us that we should group the plagues um, as follows, that we should group the plagues in a column going downward. That's the way Hirsch does it. So he says the first column has to do with alienation, the fact that the Jewish people were subject to becoming gerim, strangers in the land, and the blood, the beasts, and the hail all estranged the Egyptians from their own land, so they had a taste of what the slavery was about. And the, the next is the servitude itself, feeling unfree in the land, and that was the frogs, the, the plague on the animals, and the locusts, which, which cut you off from a sense of any sense of comfort. And the final is affliction, personal affliction, again, reading downwards. So lice, boils, and darkness is like personally afflicting the person, which is all what the um what the Egyptians did um in 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 what in, in the enslavement of the Jewish people. But tonight we're going to talk about a different way of understanding the grouping that Rebbe Yehuda does by by putting the group into um into the uh, into the three groups, and we're going to look at it as three groups of three, and we're going to really isolate and not discuss tonight the tenth plague, which is the which does stand alone in many ways, which is the death of the firstborn. And there's many many details, but I'm going to substantiate as follows: if we look at line number one as a series, the tzach, blood, frogs, lice. So if you look. I, it, it, the sentences that introduce that, it's Exodus chapter 7, sentence 17, which is on page 326 in the Stone Chumash. So if you read sentence 17, Moshe is told to tell Paro, through this shall you know that I am Hashem. So this approach, um, which is in the name of, well, I don't remember which commentary names it this way, but I think this is what's adopted by the Malvin. This approach says that the initial three plagues, blood, frogs, and lice, all had the purpose of convincing Pharaoh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians that Hashem exists and Hashem is created. And as we know, when Moshe first meets Paro and says, I'm here representing God, and God says, you shall let my people go, referring to the Jewish people as God's people, Paro's response is very direct and very simple. Who's God? Why should I listen to God? What bearing does God have on my, my power, my prerogatives, my life? And this, of course, is a starting point. So we see from this series that the first three makod were out to address Paro's initial skepticism. When Paro said, who is God that I should listen to God? So, Paro, so the response God says is, I will through the first three plagues of blood, frogs, and lice, I will teach you, as it says here, through this you shall know 
through this you shall know that I am Hashem, that there is a God. That's what you need to know. Now, we know historically that the Greek philosophers, for example, believe that the world had a creator and a beginning, but their viewpoint was that the creator is an absent, uh, absentee landlord, doesn't have anything to do with what goes on in the world, that God created and abandoned the world. So this is a limited view. For a person to come to understand and fully comprehend the fact that there is a creator of the world, and therefore, of course, that means that we have a sense of gratitude to God and that we see the world as it designed intelligently and created for a purpose. All that's included in the initial thought that Hashem created. There is a creator. The next group, which consists of the four through um, six, the beasts, which is the invasion of wild animals into the living space of the Egyptians, the plagues, which killed their, their animals, and the boils, which caused them suffering. This is to teach a second notion about God, that not only is God the creator, but God is also the supervisor and the guide of the world that God is active and involved in the world. And we would even go so far to say that there's no such thing as coincidence. There's no such thing as happenstance. There's everything that takes place in the world is under God's direct supervision and with God's understanding. And I would go so far as to say with God's approval, and that's a controversial issue. And you should know at the introduction of this week's Parsha, one of the major commentaries of Archaim has a massive discussion on how there can be evil in God's world and why God allows there to be evil and where evil comes from. But in any event, as we go through the plagues, we should understand that this series of plagues, four, five, and six, were there to teach that, um, that I supervise everything that's taking place in the world. How do we see that? If you look at sentence 818, which has to do with the fourth plague of beasts, um, and it's on page 332 in the Art Scroll Chumash, you'll see that it says as follows. I'm going to send out the animals. They'll swarm all over the land. And in sentence 18, God says, And on that day I shall set apart the land of Goshen upon which my people stands, that there shall be no swarm there, so that you will know that I am Hashem in the midst of the land, that I am Hashem who supervises, I am Hashem who is involved, I am Hashem who is active in the world. And I think we should take a moment to visualize what that means in terms of the plague of beasts, which sets off this, this series. So what does it mean? It would mean as follows, that if you were in a helicopter over Egypt, here's what you would see, according to the sentence that we just read. You would see animals gathering from all over the world, all the beasts, including, let's say, polar bears that are not native to the place, and, and, and animals that have no possible representation in Egypt, they gather throughout the world. And parenthetically, that's why the plague begins the day after it's announced, because so to speak, the minute Moshe announced the plague, God set in motion this gathering of all the wild animals of the world, and they invaded the land. So if we were, we were in a helicopter and we were flying around, and we were looking down, we would see lions and tigers and bears and all these different animals marauding through the land, terrorizing the population. And then we would see exactly at the borderline of the land of Goshen, where the Jewish people lived and inhabited, we would see an absolute line of demarcation, and there wouldn't be one wild animal crossing that line and bothering the Jewish people. And Midrashim go on to say, even if a Jewish person left the land of Goshen, and traveled into the areas occupied by the Egyptians. So there would be like a protective sphere around that person and no animal would bother them. But clearly God in lining up the demarcations of the world is showing this idea 
that God is active and involved in everything that takes place in the world. And I just want to add a thought that relates this in an important way to, the, to something else that Moshe told Pharaoh when he first met Pharaoh. If you look at the text in the beginning, when Moshe stands before Paro for the first time, Moshe says, in the name of God, let my people go, because this people is Bini Bechori Yisroel. This is a people that I have differentiated from the rest of the world. I've taken them, or I am in the process of taking them unto me as a chosen people. And therefore, they are set apart from all other peoples of the world. And in fact, it was true for all the 10 plagues that the Jewish people were untouched by them. But that process is highlighted in 4, 5, 6, because the purpose of those plagues was to demonstrate clearly that as one of the Bali Musa, the ethical teachers of the world says, when it, rain, when it rains, each of us gets wet to the extent that God expects us and wants us to get wet. Now, not that God doesn't perform miracles and, you know, don't try this out, you know, find a person that you think is an evil person and walk next to him through a rainstorm and then count how many drops of rain hit him compared to me. That's not a way of testing this system. But in general, we should know that everything that takes place happens under God's supervision. And that was the lesson which God wanted to make manifest in the world to us for all times to take to heart and to demonstrate it to the world so that there's it's on record that this is the manner in which God interacts with the world. Let's look at the next three. The next three are introduced with hail. And if you look at sentence Exodus 9, 14, which is on page, right at the end of this, towards the end of this week's Torah reading, on page 336, what does it say? Well, this time I shall send my plagues against your heart and upon your servants and your people, that you shall know that there is none like me, God, in all the world. So this series has a different added implication. And the added implication is that um, the added implication is that God not only created, um, that God not only supervises and stays on top of everything that's going on in the world, but that God is all powerful, meaning that therefore nothing stands in the way of God's will or decision making in the world. In other words, I could have tremendous supervision over my child and I could choose to be a helicopter parent, but we all know as parents how limited we really are in protecting our child the way, especially amongst the things, against the things that are most hard rending in terms of what could happen to them because we're not all powerful, but that's not true for Hashem. I'll give you an example of this in, in, in out of context here. But in other words, when the birth of Isaac is announced to Abraham and Sarah. And then God comes and sort of chastises Sarah and says, Abraham, you know, your wife laughed at that. What's the idea there? The idea is that all of us live within a reality and within a sense of reality where we are convinced that, yeah, maybe God really does care about me. Yeah, maybe God is really benevolent and kind. But what could God do for me under these circumstances? As Sarah had a brief thought, I'm 90 years old. I'm not capable of having children. These angels are announcing I'm going to have a child. That's ridiculous. And basically God mentions to Avraham to clarify the matter and says, come on, I'm God. You know, what do you think limits me in bestowing a child upon you and your wife, does your age matter? Does your circumstances matter? After all, I am God. I am all powerful. And hence, the final three leading up to the death of the firstborn, but the hail, the locusts, and the darkness, all were there to demonstrate and convince us, the Jewish people who were observing it for all time, and to instruct us 
so that we would understand only once and forever, we would understand that Hashem has these three comprehensive qualities. And that's what it means, according to Jewish tradition, to believe in God. And again, it's not a binary yes or no choice. Like they say, no atheists in the Fox Hills. Under certain circumstances, it seems like everybody's a believer. And under certain circumstances, it probably seems that nobody's a believer. But the obvious thing is that we can study and learn from and experience on Pesach night the details, so to speak, of these 10 plagues. And we can become more deeply convinced and more deeply understanding that this is what it means. This is what God is all about. That God is the creator of everything and therefore not, therefore has total responsibility for everything that exists. God supervises the world so that nothing is outside of God's purview. And Hashem is all powerful, so there's no promise that God could ever make for a person that would be that God would not be able to fulfill. And with this in mind, and I just I'm sorry, let me highlight something else here. I think that if you look at the the we last week we addressed the 13 principles of faith, but I think if you look at principle number one and principle number five, you will see that Maimonides articulates these ideas. In principle number one, I think he covers the first of Hashem being the creator and the supervisor, which reads, I believe with perfect faith, that the creator, he created, and he, he, he supervises all of his creations, and only he, Ose, Osa, the Ose, the Yase, and only God can can facilitate or enable or allow something that has happened, that is happening, or that will happen to take place. So Hashem is the creator, the author, the instigator, and the supervisor for whom no detail is, is beyond God's direct supervision. And finally, in principle number five, which talks about prayer, where we say, Maimonides asserts that we should aspire to believe with perfect faith, that it's only to God should we pray. The ain royally also, God doesn't need any help. There's no other address toward which our prayer should be aimed. Because I don't, God doesn't need help to do something. Things are ultimately in God's hand. And as was demonstrated in the plagues over and over and over again, the God of Egypt, the Nile, could be converted into blood. And, and, and hail could fall from heaven, which had a perfect harmony of fire and water, which in a natural basis don't go together, because by tradition, the hailstones had had fire burning within them, and when they splattered and hit, they not only hit like a, a hailstone, but they also burned like a fire. There's no limitation to what God's capable of doing in the world, and that's why these plagues are meaningful for us yet today, because we can come to be inspired to understand God. And that's where I wanted, would like to go back for a moment to the very first sentence in this week's Torah reading, which is a very cryptic sentence and which uh, merits a lot of attention. And that's on page 318 in the Stone Chumash. And it reads, God spoke to Moshe and said to him, I am Hashem. Now in the Hebrew, of course, two different names of God are being used. Elohim, which we're, 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 we're not pronouncing the He because it's the holy name of Hashem. And the name, the four-letter name of Hashem, which we have listed here, is Hashem. So there's something almost funny about this. If I were to say, hi, um, Rabbi Weiser spoke to you and said, I am Rabbi Weiser. Now, if you didn't know who I was, that might be okay. But if God is speaking to Moshe, he does God doesn't have to go on and say, I am God. So what's the connotation here? The name Elohim 
is associated with God's attribute of justice. So like somebody might say, oh, father's coming home from work today. He usually comes home in an angry mood. Let's get out of his way. So then he's father. And then perhaps when he's in a more gentle, relaxed mood, we might refer to him as daddy. Not that that's the way people should interact with their children, but we know that such things happen. So God is saying, God is, comes to Moshe and says to him, yes, you see the Jewish people suffering. Yes, you're despairing. Yes, you see this attribute of justice that God ha is, is taking place because after all, God foretold to Abraham that for hundreds of years, the Jewish people would be enslaved and afflicted in Egypt. And yes, that's what you see going on. But please understand that in spite of all that you see, it is still Ani Hashem. It is still, I am God, the compassionate one. I am God who deals with the world lovingly. So it's not just that I'm transitioning to a different identity or to a different frame of mind, but even those circumstances of servitude, which you took to understanding as being so harsh and so cruel, they had a purpose. And that purpose was ultimately compassionate. That purpose was ultimately associated with my name Hashem, which is a name which, which is all about acting kindly and, and acting in a compassionate way. So to put these two ideas together, I have a quote here from Rabbi Sachs that I wanted to mention. Then I have an application for what we've talked about more directly. And then I want us to think about a conclusion here together. Rabbi Sachs wrote, to this day on Passover, we eat matzah, the unleavened bread of affliction, and we taste the more or the bitter herbs of slavery to remember the sharp taste of affliction. So yes, God was being harsh with us, but why? And never be tempted to afflict others. So you see, in, in, in these beautiful words, Rabbi Sachs is really encapsulating the message of the first sentence of this week's Torah reading. That yes, there's enslavement, there's affliction, there's, 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 there's the three categories we mentioned above, of becoming alienated from from the world, of becoming of 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 suffering, but God put us through that experience so that we, as the Jewish people, to such a great extent, have been and are throughout history. We're the ones who are there to stand up for those being afflicted, and we're the ones most concerned about um, about those people who are being afflicted. And with the knowledge of the system of understanding the, 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 the plagues, where to emphasize these attributes that Hashem is the creator. Hashem is not just a passive creator, but he supervises everything. And therefore, everything that takes place has meaning and has purpose. And that Hashem is all powerful. We discuss and analyze the plagues in order to understand Hashem better, to deepen our belief and therefore be able to more robustly and deeply connect to Hashem. We're understanding God not so that we should all be theologians. That's not the point, so that we can write philosophical texts. But we're given this deep understanding of God so that we can understand our lives and place everything that happens to us within a proper context. And I think that's the overarching message. All experience in life is not simply there to teach us that, to remind us, yes, there's a creator. He supervises, he's active in my life, in the life of every human being and every being in the world. And yes, there's no limit to Hashem's power and authority and dominion over the world. But this does give us a framework that we can, we can apply to life's experiences, to the joyous, great experiences as we celebrate them in gratitude, and to the difficult challenges that we may face, to try at least to walk away with a clearer understanding that there's meaning, there's purpose, there's a creator who set the table, and that same creator oversees every molecule and every action that takes place on that table,
And it's all in keeping with the will of Hashem because there's no limitation to Hashem's ability to process, to understand, to be involved, to understand you and me as individuals, to understand our needs collectively, and to really nudge the world forward and to guide the world towards a really successful conclusion. And I think this animates for me, and hopefully for all of us, the importance of the plagues that God wrought on Egypt 3,300 and some years ago, they exist today to have an impact on the way we understand the world and the way we respond to others and then the way we make meaning out of our own lives. And therefore, yes, they have a place of great importance, like the Chovot Talavavot says, alongside the Torah itself, that teaches us our obligations and teaches us our limitations in terms of God's do's and don'ts, that gives us a, a, a picture of making meaning out of the world. And then the plagues teach us specifically their insights into understanding the nature of God in so as to best impact and influence the way we treat each other, the way we act, and the way we make our way in the world. And with that in mind, we should really look forward to studying this week's Torah reading and next week's and all the readings of the Torah and to experience Pesach at the Seder when we sit down with our families with the idea that to the extent that we can relive and evoke these experiences as being real and meaningful for us, that's the extent that we can be free. And freedom doesn't simply mean freedom from bondage or oppression which seems to be the coin of, of the land today that everyone feels as though someone's oppressing me or perhaps I'm oppressing someone else and I need to set them free, but also freedom for living a life which is filled with kindness and meaning and closeness to God and fulfilling the ultimate purpose that God created the world for. And hope and pray that and studying these parshiot and leading up to Pesach and celebrating Pesach in a few months as families amongst the Jewish people, we should take these lessons ultimately to heart and they should benefit us. Happy to answer any um, any questions if anybody has.